Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending where you are joining us uh, or from where you're joining us this uh, uh, evening in Sharjah. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, everyone uh, to our panel, Art and the Civic Imagination. Uh, let me start by thanking so much uh, Ur al Qasimi, Noor al Mu'alla, Nawar al Qasimi, and all my colleagues in the working committee of the Sharjah Art uh, Biennial. 15, and of course, to all members of the team of March Meeting 2021 that worked very hard behind the scene. Uh, Wasan Aydabi, Ryan, uh, Sana Abdul Majid, among many others, to make uh, the March Meeting or this event possible. And of course, this has been evident uh, in the way this event has been unfolding from day one. Uh, my name is Salah Hassan, and I'm, a director, I'm the director of the Africa Institute. Uh, in Sharjah, and I'm also a professor of art history and African studies at Cornell University. Uh, let me start uh, briefly by summing up the concept or the theme of the panel. The idea of the civic imagination as civic engagement is at the heart of the interest of the Sharjah Art Foundation. The March meeting uh, in and of itself is one of the manifestations of such engagement. It is also an evidence of the Sharjah Art Foundation long-term commitment to tackling many subjects and themes relevant to the arts and uh, the relationship with the civic imagination. Uh, my esteemed uh, panelist will discuss, uh, of course, new social and uh, pract uh, political practices, as well as artistic visions aimed at achieving humanity's goal uh, for a better society. As mentioned in the synopsis of this panel, ideas and conception of what comprises uh, our perception of a better society can vary a great deal. And in this regard, uh, it is our hope that this evening that the panelists will also comment on art and curating as a spaces for imagining what such a, what such a society might look like. Biennials, unlike uh, museums, tend to involve participatory or challenging projects that are not necessarily or purely aesthetic. That is to say, they possess social and political implications as well as potentially risky interventions. These social and political implications are also exhibited in the form of practices that are mobilized in thinking about curating and presenting the art. Allow me now to welcome the panelists and introduce each of them in the order of their appearances. Uh, uh, none of these, in my view, none of them, in my view, uh, needs an introduction. It's include a wonderful group of uh, composed of the artist, Zarina Bimji, who will go first, and two art historians and theorists and curators, and dear friends, Gita Kapoor and Ming Tiambo. Um, I will try to be very brief to allow time, of course, for presentation and discussion, as detailed in the, uh, as the detailed bios are actually very well uh, presented in all the programs and the uh, websites of the March meeting 2020. Uh, let me start by Zarina Bimji, who is no doubt among the most important artists of our time. Through the diverse mediums of photography, film, and installation, Zarina, as Zarina's practice engages with questions of institutional power and vulnerability and universality and intimacy. Uh, therefore, she's well grounded to be in this panel. Uh, Bimji uh, solo group and exhibitions include many in prominent uh, forums, such as Documenta, The Venice, and Lahore Biennials, in addition, of course, uh, to her current exhibition, which I wanted to alert our audience, especially those who are in the UAE, uh, is our latest show, Zarina Bimji Black Pocket, that is curated by Hora Qasim. Uh, the artist has received, of course, many recognition, including uh, the Smithsonian Artist a Research Fellowship, among many others, such as the Paul Hamlin Foundation. Uh, she lives, uh, she was born in Uganda, and lives and, and works between, of course, or in, in London, let's say, and Uganda. Um, um, Gita Kapoor. Gita Kapoor is an art critic and a curator whose work engages with issues related to national and post-colonial paradigms, heterodox modernism, critical contemporaneity, and the curatorial positioning of artwork in India and the global south. There is no doubt in my mind when the history of art history or the historiography of modernism as a concept on our ideology are accurately written, Gita Kapoor will emerge as a foundational figure 
who challenges the Western monopoly as well as the construction of the model. Through her incisive uh, works, she opened our mind to the multiplicity of the modern, its heterodoxy, moving well beyond the idea of alternative or vernacular modernist discourse. I mean, of course, that is during the time that happened in terms of challenging the Western discourse of the modern people resorted to those uh, alternative and vernacular. And definitely, uh, Gita Kapoor, through her work, that questions and that is start actually with the question, when was modernism, that is essays on contemporary cultural practice in India, it stands among the pioneering work that opened our eyes uh, and made it possible for my generation, I would say that, to challenge Western universalist narrative of the modern and of the mainstream art history. Uh, Gita, of course, is based in New Delhi, where she continued to live and work. Uh, Ming Kiambo is a curator, researcher, and writer whose work engages with transcultural models of, and histories that provide new structures for understanding and reconfiguring global norms. Uh, Ming curatorial projects include many, and I've mentioned few, Anywhere Prints, Japanese Inspiration, that was held at the Canadian Museum of Civilization and two through 2011 and 2014. And then Gutai, a splendid uh, playground that was at the Solomon Guggenheim Museum in New York in 2013. Uh, among the most important of her uh, publications uh, on Japanese modernism and global modernism and diaspora, it stands a book, Gutai, Decentering Modernism, that was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2011. She received a number of awards and, and, and grants, uh, including World in, uh, 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 Public Cultures, and um, among many others, and I wouldn't be able to recite all of them. She's a professor of art history at Carlton University, Ottawa. So welcome all of you to the panel, and I will start as we organize the panel ahead of time in series of, of uh, panels that will be a series of presentations that will go between 20, 15 to 20 minutes. And let me start by uh, Zarina Bimji's presentation. Welcome, Zarina. Thank you. Thank you, Salah. It's such a pleasure to be here at the March meeting. Um, it's a shame that we can't meet in person, uh, but at least we can do it visually. Uh, I wanted to start by saying thank you to uh, the curatorial team for having my exhibition in Sharjah Art Foundation. I'd like to thank Hoor, Aya, Ryan, Ambika, Noor, and all the other people who worked so hard to make my exhibition possible. So what I plan to do is talk a little bit about um, the, the idea of um, art and civic imagination. And then since we are not together, I would love to show you my uh, exhibition here in Sharjah. So um, I would like, could you put the images on, please? sorry. Great, thank you. Um, so my question is, I have sets of questions around this theme. How do I host an ancestor, the great indigenous makers? What is the essential stuff? Who are the forebearers? I wanted to make the, that pilgrimage, command for craft, depth of skill. I can hear the voices of the ancestors. Your great, your otherness is great. Go for it, go and find it. My first forebearers started at evening school when I was 15. There, when I was 15, I heard of Charles Booth, the social reformer. And in my sociology class, we looked at maps. There, there were maps of explaining where people with poverty lived. And this, this was the beginning of my understanding uh, of what I wanted to do uh, in terms of being an artist. So I started to follow that impulse that was internal. I wanted to understand the psychotic European form, the measuring, the colonialism. 
The idea of repair speaks a lot to me. You can mend it, but you can't erase the damage. You can show the fault line. How, how do you show the damage that has occurred? You can make it, uh, you can make it beautiful within the possibilities of the repairs. To look at where the damage is, is like looking at a building of heritage, like a Georgian building. This approach is to do with acknowledgement of the past, but hopefully find a new use. Sorry, I've lost. To, to look at its structure is, and to find, to continue to use the same use, to find a new use. To change its use is to make a film, a poem, a photograph. You can move the structure. It was the place of damage. As an artist, you find an agency, an act to move it. To make the intervention is an act of caring. It's a dress, it becomes more attractive that has been repaired. You can see the mend, you can see that someone cared. And when I show the work, she'd love to breathe pure silence. This is what I'm referring to, like issues of virginity tests that were taken when South Asian women entered Britain but it was never legalized. It is this that I like to um, talk about in my work, but through means of poetry rather than immediate politics, because poetry is what is moving. So as an artist, you can choose where damage matters. It is an act of recuperation, dignity, finding the form, be it sound, film. How do I find the key to my history, which is in a, in a physical form, in the making? I felt invisible with the history of the material. When I'm making in the studio, I'm asking who was I, my body and race, are into the work, fragile moments, embedding them in physical objects, in turn to interrogate the present moments. Now I shall share the screen with you to show you the exhibition in Sharjah. I don't move the images, thank you, thank you. Um, this is, this is the work that is um, lead white, um, done in archives. Um, and I wanted this to be one piece of work in a form of like a musical score. And I decided to, at the last minute, um, show uh, embroider a map to show how Europe had conquered Africa, but I wanted it to be delicate in a form of embroidery. These were the works, light boxes that I made just before Documenta 11. I was aware that um, the Africa that I loved, I never saw in images. Usually you saw starving poor people of Africa and I, I wanted it to be like a beautiful objects. These are sketches. D 
there's a film that was made, uh, shot in India. We refabricated this work that was a lot earlier made. There are glass shoe boxes questioning how museums present other cultures. I wanted it to be a personal museum. And this is a film shot in um, Nairobi, Kenya, East Africa. I'm sorry, I don't have the film here. These are just the stills. Um, I usually do research, um, travel and do long research, long recce, because I see that as a laboratory to understand and tease out and that's how the work is made. And this is the work that I was referring to that was, uh, it's called She'd Love to Breathe Pure Silence, where I wanted to talk about the virginity test. The materiality is really important to me because somewhere in between research and the material, something happens, but also uh, the fact that it has spices on the floor, it, it's, a, it's a, like a performance each time, but also it's um, uh, earlier Salah mentioned about curating and uh, spaces where um, there has always been a problem with putting the spices on the floor. Um, whereas for me, it's a cultural statement that I'm here or we are here to stay. And similar gloves like this were used for virginity tests. And this is the film um, Out of Blue, which I showed for Documenta 11, which was shot in Uganda. Okay, thank you. I will stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you. So should I begin? All right. First of all, I'd just like to start by thanking um, the Charger Art Foundation for having me here as part of the March meeting. Um, I'd like to thank Salah for including me in this conversation and for the opportunity to be in dialogue with um, both Serena Bimji and um, Gita Kapoor. Um, that was a, a it was a lovely um, introduction to the exhibition, um, Zarina. And I only wish that I could be there in person to see it. Um, it just really seems like it it holds so much in terms of the conversation that um, we will be having today, but also in terms of um, the kinds of explorations that are so rich in your work. If we have learned nothing else in the past twelve months, it is that we are interconnected. A single breath on one side of the world travels to all four corners, and we all breathe as one planetary organism, albeit one diseased with inequality. The past year has radically altered our understanding of the contours of the civic imagination, arguably our civic imaginations, radically shrinking our physical worlds, while at the same time creating the conditions 
for expanding our imagined worlds, the ones where we consider ourselves citizens. Indeed, the fact that we are all gathered here from the four corners of the globe, reflecting on shared futures is extraordinary and represents a prosthetic extension of the mechanisms of community. From the soundscapes defined by the call to prayer or church bells, to the imagined communities engendered by print media, to online communities like the ones that we inhabit today. Besides the ever expanding scale, however, what is novel with the virus is the weak tether to physical communities, which for the time being have become imprints of memory and socially distanced gesticulations, removing opportunities for random sociality with strangers. Social interactions these days are much more purposeful, reducing weak tie friendships and social club solidarities, which take us across ideological boundaries, whether we like it or not. Rashid Ayarin's Shamiana, Food for Thought, Thought for Change at Documenta 14, a project supported by the Sharjah Art Foundation, encouraged such chance encounters in Kotsia Square in Athens breathing life back to this declining public space by serving free meals to passerby and purposely mixing groups so that artists broke bread with students, refugees with local shopkeepers, with curators. After Documenta, Shamiana reopened as a permanent social space in Stoke Newington area, in the Stoke Newington area of London, continuing to serve free meals and now during the pandemic, takeaway. Day after day, unexpected social encounters take place, staging communications across ideological, linguistic, and social boundaries, while also providing communities of care in crisis. As much as the digital world has extended our horizons, it has also narrowed them, creating ideological and social silos that do not have to contend with dissent and reality checks, empathy and compromise. Even more than ever, as it is becoming easy to slide into our comfort areas and echo chambers. Art must contend with the public imagination, with public culture and of spaces of engagement. We must engage in a poetics of relation and be aware of the fact that we have no other choice. In this age of populist ethno-nationalisms and social distancing, it is crucial for us to see that we are entangled from the, state of, from the scale of microorganisms to the planetary, from local heterogeneities, communities and historical layers to global intersections and movements. As Shilpa Gupta asks, where do I end and you begin? How can we creatively imagine the we of the civic imagination across national borders, ideological differences, race, class, ability, gender and sexuality? The task of art history is to think beyond its disciplinary logics rooted in 18th century nationalism, nation building, the creation of national collections, national archives, and even the logics of national competition enshrined in large scale Biennale. It is to introduce ant colonies into the structures of art history as Yanagi Yukinori did to Alfred Bohr's his, Barr's history of cubism and abstract art and to allow a million other stories to slowly recolonize its singular fiction. The task of art history is to decolonize those fictions and to reveal the ways in which modernism was both made possible and necessary to the colonial project as Hank Willis Thomas does in colonialism and abstract art surfacing not just the contributions of African art to the history of modernism, but the histories of colonialism and violence that brought those objects to Europe. The task of art history, excuse me for a second. The task of art history is to imagine new scales of analysis, to seek new ways of building art histories and to find new connections and resonances and to imagine new structures of affiliation here I am showing you an excerpt from one of my current research projects that examines the histories of overseas students at the Slave School of Fine Arts, which includes my co-panelist Zarina Bimji, 
Um, and also um, Vivan Sundra, who is sitting just off stage um, next to Gita. The aim of this project is to find new modalities that enable us to read archives against and along the grain and to understand the absences in order to tell the stories that have been suppressed, forgotten, or never imagined to have existed. It seeks to transversal articulations of urgencies that appear parallel, relational comparisons, decenterings, and worldly affiliations, which help us to think imaginatively about how we are connected rather than forced apart, to dig deep into the scorched ground to reveal the invisible mycorrhizal networks that link our roots, the radical foundations of our art histories. We must understand the palimpsests of histories and cultures that constitute place beyond nationalist rhetorics. If we are to understand the complexities of localities, we need to delve into the histories and present tense of conquest. Migration, trade, circulation, conflict, war, and colonization that create complex cultures in the most unlikely of places. In imperial and artistic centers, both major and minor, we must seek to unearth the suppressed stories of colonial subjects and the lateral networks that they created in those centers, as well as the ways in which they contributed to their new ecosystems. In settler colonial nations, we must grapple with the occupation of unceded lands and find new treaty relationships of mutual respect and co-constituted cultures that reflect the heterogeneity of our communities that live and breathe together. These entanglements are temporal as well as spatial. And if we wish to have a liberatory politics of the present and of the future, we must interrogate the past, which haunts the now, what Jinmi Yoon calls vertical time. In her work, Living Time, Yoon imagines human existence at the scale of geological time with the histories of colonialism and the Anthropocene entangled. Each of us carries intergenerational histories of trauma, war and colonialism in and through our bodies and we must seek to understand the ways in which we have been historically enmeshed. We must find ways to unlearn imperialism, to use Ariella Aisha Azule's words, in order to understand how colonial histories sought to disentangle our pasts in order to extract purified narratives that justified conquest of other peoples and of the planet. In her world-making research on mycorrhizal systems, the networks of sun, soil fungi that correlate trees beyond the, below the ground, allowing them to communicate warnings and share resources even across species. Ecologist Suzanne Simard asks, how do trees collaborate? In seeking to understand the subterranean networks that enable lateral systems to grow and generate discursive ecosystems, we as scholars, curators, and artists must also learn to collaborate to build structures and reform existing institutions to enable collaboration. A relational art history is not possible without collaboration, listening and collaborative forms of knowledge formation. Collaboration enables the putting in relation of worlds and worldviews, opening up possibilities of negotiation and the healing of difficult histories. Rather than producing polarized narratives that fail to find middle ground, Collaborative and relational histories seek to co-constitute spaces in which coexistence becomes possible. True collaboration is not always easy as power must cede territory to previously marginalized voices and the margins must cede purity of conviction, calling others in rather than out. In Tanaka Koki's works, collaboration is used as a medium to stage experiments about togetherness, friction and intersubjective form. How do five potters make a pot together? How do five pianists play a piano together? How do five poets write a poem together? How do five hairdressers cut hair together? More recently, he has been exploring questions of history, attempting to understand the difficult colonial histories of Korea and Japan through embodied relations. Collaboration links lived worlds epistemologies, ontologies, expertise, and language proficiencies to construct frameworks of analysis that are complex and nuanced. 
For too long, academia and the art world have been governed by a Darwinian logic of competition that pits scholars, curators, and artists against each other, rewarding individual achievements grown in soils enriched by many actors. By creating affective communities of shared purpose, rather than environments administered by neoliberal assessments, we can create more fertile conditions for the mycorrhizal networks necessary to write the radically entangled worlded, multivocal, and decolonized histories that are crucial for our planetary survival. Just as relational art history cannot be practiced by individuals alone, it should not exist alone. We must create forest schools and embrace publics. We must find ways to nurture the growth of our mycorrhizal networks to sustain and connect more and different types of ecosystems. We must make the heterogeneous and entangled lattices that live in the forest floor visible to larger publics so that toxic myths of monoculture cannot take hold. Rafael Lozano Hemmer's work has long used technology to create and connect publics, often with poetic projects that arouse empathy for political ends that such, such as connecting strangers across the Mexico-US border or memorializing disappeared students in Mexico. In this time of global mourning, Lozano Hemmer built an online platform for public mourning and the articulation of grief, which invites relatives to submit photographs of COVID victims so that their faces can be read, rendered in hourglass sand, alluding to the fragility of life over the past year and creating communities of mourning across borders in defiance of vaccine nationalism, as well as protesting the failures of governments who failed to act. Art and our public institutions can and should play a powerful role in changing public culture. Rather than seeking short-term growth and yield, to use another forestry term, our institutions of higher learning and imagination must rise to the global challenges of our, our democracies now face. In this task, art and art history in particular and the humanities in general can play an important role in grappling with difficult histories revealing our entangled ecosystems and building new narratives of empathy, care, and collaboration for the survival of the species and of the planet rather than the survival of the fittest. Thank you. Gita, you have to be unmuted, sorry. Thank you, all those that have put together this wonderful program from Kur to the team and now to Salah, who's chairing this panel. This is the first time that I'm attending the March meeting. So I had hoped that it might be a more uh, personal and a personal and subjective understanding of the of the environment, the the phenomenon of Sharjah Biennale, but this too is very gratifying. The title, Art and the Civic Imagination, has in, engaged me in uh, reading many times over the texts of Okvi and Bizor. And in a sense, this is a dialogue with him. The civic is no default term. Not only does it raise questions about its relation with the political, but also what special reason there is for placing it, as Okui and Bizo does, in conjunction with art and imagination. We are inclined to work with the dialectic between aesthetics and politics. The political has an edge within the cultural field whether in consideration of the near ontological relationship between poesis and praxis, or on the other hand, as a conjunctural event in the way of an avant-garde. Yet political activism, having been enacted by artists with deep commitment, appears sometimes to have been made contingent within the maneuvers of neoliberal cultures. At the same time, the term civic, though it is sustainable, might be regarded by the artist herself as but a quest for participatory protocol 
without the necessary risk. It is useful then to place Oki's proposition about the civic imagination, both in retrospect and in the immediate present. Already in 2002, his Documenta 11 project mapped four plus one platforms across the world as an unprecedented experiment in locating art within a discursive field. The Documenta 11 platforms were planned with the view that they discourse around the potentials of civil society and the politics of the post-colonial contemporary would be inserted into art critical discourse. Okfi's perspectival vision for the platform staged in Vienna, Delhi, St. Lucia and Logos were, were, laid out, was, were laid out in this manner. The first platform, Democracy Unrealized, engage with protracted negotiations over constitutional rights, political alternatives, and the space of dissent by the citizens of a putative nation state. Experiments with truth, the engaged with uh, or are considered in deep uh, concern at the, that point of time with the fragilization of subjectivities and the test of truth between perpetrators and victims in the phase of post-colonial rehabilitation. Creolite and creolization, the valence, considered the valencies of colonial modernity, ethnic hybridization, radical redefinition of community and subjecthood within societies in transition. Under siege, which included, which considered four African cities, the, dwelt on the improvisatory nature of post-colonial modernity, the handling of rogue economies and tattered governments by the resourcefulness of urban populations. Platform five, the, exhib the exhibition in Cassel, Okwi asked, from what is art autonomous? And then proceeded to relay through exhibitory modes how artistic practices navigate their historicity. Okwi invites us today to thinking historically in the present, at the same time as he engages us in unraveling the present. He thereby transposes two time scales, diasporic, sorry, he, he thereby transposes two time scales, displacing perhaps the conjunctural notion of the contemporary with which, for instance, I tend to work. He opens a site of affiliation and relatedly for civic engagement to imagine more communitarian or what he later called on a, or in, a, in, a, in, in another context, locus agonostis local, or the locus of struggles. And Vizor's uh, 2012 lecture titled Civitas, Citizenship, Civility, Art and the Civic Imagination from the which gives us the title of this panel, panel, given in Berlin in conjunction with the curated exhibitions and extensive programming for meeting point six, and was spread across the Middle East, North Africa, and, and Europe over 2011 and 2012. This sets the stage for today's panel, but not having used the concept nor seen it used in similar terms in India, I needed to understand why civic imagination? Okui would have had in mind the civic consequences of the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa and the trauma assuaged and produced by it. But more specifically at the time, it was the Arab Spring, Spring which represented momentous histories erupting across the full scale of violence and civic dissent. As Okwi said, Arab, Arab societies were then facing the rupture between antagonistic political camps and liberatory possibilities within a critical culture. His belief in civic imagination seemed to have been elicit, elicited then from such possibilities that emerge from intensely fraught political situations, militaristic regimes and autocracy that produce fierce and imaginative struggles, reason, dissent, and emancipatory logics, prognosticating 
democratic futures. I come now to a section about India, which uh, is in some ways inserted within the, uh, the overall concept, but has a certain independent uh, uh, engagement with the subject. The extraordinary constitution of the Indian Republic was adopted in 1950s, 1950. Its rigorous formulation led by the legal mind of a Dalit citizen to be Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar, committed to grant full enfranchisement as well as the right of affirmative representation to the minorities of an oppressed caste, surviving within a grossly unequal societal structures, caste-ridden, gender oppressive, and communally fractured as that of India. Ideolo ideological cont contestations between India's Marxist subaltern studies and Dalit thinkers set a pace of theor theoretical unraveling of the nation state and a continual engagement with the contradictions between rights and reality of citizens, including the distributive inequalities of a post-colonial economy. At the present juncture, India's right-wing government has wholly capitulated, despite its ultra-nationalist ideology, before the, direct, before the diktat of global capital and its Indian mediators, resulting in further immiseration of both urban labor and the peasantry. In consequence, there are the beginnings of mass uprisings of millions of citizens, both radically motivated and vulnerable, becoming conscious of their potential role in history. India has, as we know, a history of the greatest mass movements of the 20th century. Gandhi's nonviolent civil disobedience movement con confronted Imperial Britain over three decades, culminating in, India, India, in Indian independence in 1947. A jump into the present. In December 2019, Delhi's Shaheen Bagh neighborhood emerged as a nationwide symbol of resistance against a combination of of law, policy, and census exercise designated by the present government for targeted disenfranchisement, specific, specifically for India's Muslim population. The government plans to ordain even existing citizens to prove their citizenship through required documents. And as women who, have, who tend to have less documentation in a patriarchal society, they, they can become the most vulnerable and excluded. This turn towards a conditional de democracy led to a massive protest led by hundreds and thousands of Muslim women embarking upon a nonviolent civil disobedience movement with 24 hour sit ins. Zoya Hassan, a text by Zoya Hassan occupying streets, women in the vanguard of the anti CAA struggle. CAA refers to the Citizen Amendment Act, emphasizes how for the first time, women are leaders sustaining civil society mobilization through reading out the preamble of the constitution. We the, we, the people of India, resolve to secure to all citizens of the Democratic Republic, justice, liberty, equality, fraternity. The women of Shaheen Bagh prepared a site and invented forms to embody their citizenship. Readings were organized, classes for young children were devised, bookshops and lending libraries were set up, and there was where there was a blurring of lines between everyday routine and actions of protest. Large murals appeared on the walls of the nearby university, flags, slogans, and above all, music and poetry brought thousands of Delhiites into the Shaheen Bagh. On the day the site was cleared because of the COVID lockdown, the women left their placards and their Hawaii sandals behind as presents and not as memorials. This preparation of a makeshift encampment is a language that has been used and increased a thousandfold by the protesting farmers today. Even as we speak, India is witness, witnessing the largest mass rallies of our times. 
the Indian farmers protest against the black laws passed by the present government, laws that seek to deliver the Indian farmer into the hands of the corporate sector. In 2007, Marxist, Marxist economist Utsa Patnaik called India the Republic of Hunger. This further dispossession will multiply the relay of farmers' suicides. Beginning in mid-2020, these peaceful assemblies have taken the form of rallies, tractor parades, and town-sized town encampments on roads leading to the capital city of Delhi, from which they are debarred through uh, almost uh, military, uh, uh, military-like barricades, barbed wires, uh, trenches, and um, nails on the ground. There are huge marches in Mumbai and other parts of India. In any one of the biggest rallies, there could be up to 4 million persons gathered in solidarity and addressed by, union farm, by the union farm leaders of different political persuasions, but united on the common economic demand, extend state support to the agricultural producers that comprise 70% of the Indian population. Marxist economist Prabhat Patnaik emphasizes the concrete basis of this phenomenon. Movements are over issues affecting material life. Typically, unite movements over issues affecting material life typically unite people. The ongoing Kisan struggle, Kisan means farmer, the on ongoing Kisan struggle, described as the biggest mass movement in the world, is one such. The shared material base produces generosity and endurance, sustained by living together on the highways for months. Additionally, the use of cultural symbols of live communities, inherited narratives of historical struggles, and allegories of moral truths produce what we might call the civic and cultural imaginaries. These nurture the political ground of mass struggles. Song of, songs above all offer mythic memories and spontaneous solidarity. The Kisan Andola, the farmer's anthem, has been played over 35 million times. Counting an entire set of so songs produced during this period, the total viewing count could be something like 350 million on YouTube. The songs are played at the protest sites on makeshift stages and on tractors. Singers stand up upon huge speakers and wade into the public. And they reach across the global Indian diaspora. These are songs that retool the balladeering and Sufi traditions of the Punjab. They also work with rap and rhythm, mixing slogans and speech. They lampoon the present prime minister and uh, in cahoots with the two of the biggest corporate houses. And as folklore, they dwell on the need for unity and nonviolence, asking farmers to prepare for a prolonged struggle. Already, in the 2000, in, already since 2016, the youth of the country, along with intellectuals, journalists, activists, and artists, have waged fierce battles over the right to public education, freedom of expression with dis for dissenting ideologies of the left and Dalit activists against the destru destruction of Kashmir and the proposed Citizen Amendment Act. The turmoil in India is matched by state repression through extreme surveillance, laws of sedition, police brutality, vigilance, vigilante violence, and trialless incarceration. I have not in this presentation spoken about the transformation of these contestations into the language of art. The turmoil of India will, aside from activist art, require a period of deep gest gestation. And we await that uh, in the months or years to come and not in, 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 in some ways uh, labor on examples. Partha Chatterjee, leading political theorists of subaltern studies, handling the more volatile categories of citizenship that abide within or without the nation, stakes his recent argument 
and in what, on what he titles in his book, The Politics of the Government, uh, sorry, The Politics of the Governed, Reflections on Popular Politics in Most of the World. And he seeks a certain understanding, however indeterminate, on what is it that is driving the energies and aspirations of numerous people in most of the world. This was perhaps Okui, Okui's question as well. Come to the uh, a third part of the, of the presentation, which is to do with the Kochi Muzuris Biennale. Today, it is the Biennales that define the contours of contemporary art. Indeed, even the museums are required to weigh their options accordingly. That the Biennales have multiplied more in the South is especially telling and certainly not accidental. Within what we call the global public sphere, the Biennales of the South are post-colonial constellations of the contemporary, where the contemporary is defined by the antinomies between equally the retroactive methodologies that command history, an inverted leap of the avant-garde, perhaps. In philosophic terms, it is almost as if texts, images, and canons of the modern are now being processed by a hermeneutical, are now being processed by a hermeneutics of doubt, whereby the history of the modern becomes more reflexive and contrarily more precarious. The cumulative, cumulative experience of Southern Biennales and Triennales is now mature and these, these will be discussed over the next days as they are across uh, many um, conferences and workshops. I will speak of just one aspect of, the, of a collateral reach of the Kochi Muzuris Biennale. The, and as the curator of the last edition of the Biennale, Anita Dube is speaking later in this program, I'll restrict myself to one aspect. That this Biennale is located in peninsular Kerala and called the Kochi Muzuris Biennale brings into its fold a reference to the long disappeared seven, second century BC port town with trade, trade links to North America and Egypt, the Arab world and the Roman empire. And incidentally, to this day, possibly the largest influx of migrant labor to UAE comes from Kerala. The decision to locate the Biennale in Kerala was both deliberate and fortuitous. The left front government, or even alternatively, the Congress party supports all the arts in their traditional, modern and contemporary forms by setting up progressive institutions and eliciting on account of the state's high literacy, vast and argumentative audiences. The decade of the Kochi Muziris Biennale endorses elusive aspects of art practice, yet deploys political intelligence to launch collateral forms of cultural discourse and public interventions. Very early, or in fact, in the first uh, occasion of its presentation in 2012, the, the directors and co-founders co and curators of the Kochi Muziris Biennale called it the People's Biennale. And this is not just rhetoric because in Kerala, this would make very good sense in terms of the political context in which this is located, a people's Biennale. At, at a practical level, the trust, this translates into a struggle to develop the publics of art. One major consideration, the Kochi Muziris Biennale is committed to realize. Indeed, public viewing is such as to astound artists, curators, and general viewers from India and abroad. Kochi and the KMB have put to test the famous educational quotient in Kerala society. Literacy in Kerala is the highest in South Asia and possibly further across the region. You see many thousands of viewers reading every wall text with perfect diligence, as if matching one form of liter literacy to another, textual to visual, the aesthetic of which they find coded, but evidently also engaging. Further, in every edition, a systematically programmed discourse, discursive component includes talks, films, screenings, and seminars, 
ranging from intensive considerations of the site of Kochi and Kerala and the civilizational cosmopolitanism that the region has sustained um, uh, till today. I will describe an unusual feature, Kochi Musris Biennale's student Biennale, initiated with the second edition of the Biennale in 2014 by the co-founder and director of programs until 2018, Rias Como, and then subsequently conceptualized and curated in collaboration with the Kochi Musris Foundation by Vidya Shivdas, director of the Foundation of Indian Contemporary Art in Delhi. The vast majority of Indian art schools are hopelessly impoverished in support and vision. The Students Biennale has developed into a phenomenon, phenomenon functioning in surprising forms of adjacency. Here student artists and their peer-like curators voluntary, voluntarily refrain from any competitive ambition. Instead, a rhizomatic structure of spread and fold besides across the main sites of the Biennale comes into uh, view, almost as if this were an interstitial formation. Preempted by in intensive pedagogy that includes conceptualizing practice and curating art history and theory, political and civic concerns, it prompts young student artists to encounter the international event of the Biennale along detours that address their own fraught position in civic, national, and global space, or my, what might, through the digital commons, may become their transcultural trans futures. In conclusion, I'm inclined, again, to retranslate the terms of the civic imagination to in, into political imaginaries that conduct transgressions in the realm of the aesthetic. And I, uh, here I paraphrase uh, a, a, a short passage by Chantal Mouffe, who incidentally, Okui acknowledged in both his talk and during the delivery of the talk where he found her sitting in the audience. Agonistic politics in the way of an adversarial, agnostic, agnostic politics in the way of an adversarial dialogue stakes itself on counter hegemonic discourse. The political recognizes ruptures and develops categories and practices that give agency to the individual through public contestation. And here the surprise in, and here is the surprise in Chantal Mouffe's argument. This form of agonism holds within the possibility, within it, the possibility of elective solidarities even collectives while developing affective presence and what she calls passion. This is the perfect ground for the aesthetic where affect is imminent and opens out a spectrum of possibilities that spring from the sites of struggle. Processing, unraveling and unraveling and conjunct both processing of unravelings and comp conjunctures that situate the contemporary in historical perspective. I will read the last sentence again. This is the perfect ground for the aesthetic where the affect is imminent and opens out a spectrum of possibilities that spring from the sites of struggle, processing of processes of unraveling and conjunctures that situate the contemporary in historical perspective. Thank you. Well, thank you all for a very uh, for, I mean, great and rich uh, presentation and uh, that raised many issues and indeed engaged with the uh, subject matter or the theme of the uh, panel itself, which is uh, art and the civic imagination. Um, I would like to encourage all attendees, uh, and they are invited here to share the questions uh, to the panelists on the chat. So please do so. Uh, and of course, there is translation, even if some of you are engaged in English or uh, in Arabic. Uh, so let me start with uh, Zarina. Uh, and in the process, of course, uh, if there are any questions from the uh, attendees and the audience, uh, 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 we will uh, get to them. 
Uh, also, among the panelists, I also want to encourage a form of discussion and exchange of ideas. So, but let me uh, begin with Zarina. Uh, my, Zarina, my, my first encounter with your work, I remember in a, in a kind of a magnificent way has been in Documenta 11, where uh, I encountered your, your photograph, which are, if my memory um, kind of saved me in this, it was re re related to your own legacy as a Yogandan of South Asian descent and as an uprooted person due to all the events that are related to the Idi Amin encounter and, 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 and uh, uh, decisions with regard to South Asians. Uh, of course, if I listen to you and listen to you talking about the process of research and making art uh, uh, or your art, uh, there is always this basic idea of engaging with the history in the present. I mean, there's always a, go a going back and rethinking, earth, researching, and earthing. And, and my memory always of these photographs of empty, vacant lots, but that speaks volume of a history that's continued to haunt us, whether they are uh, an abandoned uh, railway station, whether they were former uh, you know, torture chambers, whether they are abandoned schools, uh, and so forth. Uh, how do you see yourself now in looking at what I could characterize as, as like a Sudanese too, like this multiple marginalities. You are a Ugandan, you're also South Asian, you, your family was there as a first generation, then all of you uh, uh, went to England and many other as, you know, places of diaspora, but then you return back. If you can uh, just through examples of work, uh, Reflect on your early encounter and what it meant for you in terms of thinking historically in the present through your work. Yes. Um, well, in terms of answering your question, where do I, where, why did I go back to Uganda? I think um, during Documenta 11, there were uh, discussions and I felt that going out on site rather than working in my studio, I would open up a different form of engagement in terms of um, on many levels. So I suppose um, visiting prisons, I could relate to it on a physical level in terms of light textures, but also the fact that they were built by Germans or the British, uh, then relating to some legal documents that were in the library that I read historically, because I wanted to uh, make sense of um, who was I in a way, because I was born in Africa and I always felt African, but somehow that I didn't look African. So that it was, it was, but it was mainly going back to because I knew using the period of Idi Amin as 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 a laboratory to kind of make sense of power, institution, um, questions. But the work wasn't about Uganda. It was. I hope that it sort of moved and looked at. Um, various regimes that that have taken place in Rwanda, uh, you know, about power and politics. Um, so, so that that is what my interest is. But also, I think that um, r relating to, like in Jangba, the landscape uh, that I filmed, even now. Um, to understand that some parts of it, that whilst the British were there, you couldn't, people don't use it, the Africans don't use it. So it's just making sense of those textures and light and trying to give it some kind of voice to it through using sounds of um, mosquitoes. Um, for me, that has an atmosphere of um, uh, claustrophobia and how to talk about illiteracy, you know, it's, it's, it's that it's, but it's done in a visual form rather than 
being able to speak rather it's i can express that much more through my lens through composition uh, i have always struggled to speak about these things but when i'm making it it sort of unravels and the discussions like document 11 or what gita was saying they add to that tapestry as well i hope that answers the question it, it answered the question because i i could see that you, from uganda you started engaging with the whole uh, history and landscape of, of the eastern coast of africa uh, if you can just talk briefly about how that evolved because your latest work engages zanzibar and many other places yeah yes um well um when uh I was given Paul Hamlin Award, and that was a change in my practice. Um, it, I no longer felt that working from the studio was effective and that I needed to go. So what, what I do is when I'm in places like, for example, I go to Zanzibar, um, I feel that whilst I'm here, there is a kind of a silence of certain kind of histories or certain kind of sounds. And by being on location, I'm entering into another level of what it felt like the texture of hair or not being able to speak. So that, that's, uh, that's how I kind of got into it, uh, yes. Thank you so much. Uh I wanted to give you know, a chance for other people to engage, but I quickly just move to uh, Ming. Um, you gave us through your presentation a very quick, you know, kind of a tour through the idea of, of, of art and the civic engagement or the civic imagination. You started with Rashid Arain uh, as an example of the civic engagement and, and the unexpected or expected results of such encounter. Sheila Gupti too. Uh, Sheila Gupta too, and the whole uh, uh, engagement with ethnic nationalism, as later, of course, in the work of, of uh, Gita, also have been elaborated uh, on the theoretical level, and through Yanagi and 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 Tranquilis Thomas' engagement with the history of modernism, and then you, you your current project, which is really enlightening and great, the, the, the whole engagement with the history of the slave, sort of internationalizing through thinking through the overseas, which I think got a response because I think what I noticed is that the slave has been responding to this documentary. So all of a sudden when I was researching Salah uh, or uh, Iftikhar talking about Shamza and others, we knew about these stories, these people met, but then suddenly now there is that kind of history, there are archives to it. But um, as much as you're trying to dissenter, I wonder how do you deal with the contradiction here of the fact that it end up also centering as much as you needed to see to dissenter, which is inescapable in the history of imperial and, 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 and uh, the history of empire, that the slave becomes a, a place for, for many artists outside who studied there. It's a place of legitimization and so forth, something that they look in a positive way to, and, but in, the, in, in other ways also end up centering empire there. What, what do you think of? Or how do you deal with it in that wonderful presentation? Which, by the yeah. way, I, I, I love and I love the uh, animation of it. Thank you. Well, I have to thank my wonderful graduate student uh, Pansy Atta for having made the animation. Um, so it's a very good question, Salah, and it's one that I certainly struggle with, um, especially when dealing with these histories of empire. Um, I choose to take it on because um, I think it's important for us in writing art histories to rethink centers as well as the so-called peripheries um, in order to demonstrate that the, the so-called centers themselves were um, co-constituted and complex places. Um, in terms of how do we tell those stories without recentering these centers, um, I think it's a, it's a very tricky balance. And it's really about uh, centering the stories of these artists who came to the Slade um, from different parts of the Global South and, and focusing on those stories and understanding what kinds of 
parallels and transversals and um, stories that we can build out of the relationships that they built, like social relationships, for sure. Those are the most obvious ones. But also, how do we understand um, these relational comparisons? How do we understand the transversals, the um, parallels between the experiences and the aesthetic practices of people who went through, who had these trajectories um, and who shared common histories. Those common histories, of course, being the history of colonialism, the history of migration, um, of being taught within the pedagogies of um, a, a colonial structure, which also had, you know, um, a, a very, which was very, a very complex place too, um, given the, the ways in which they, uh, the Slade also related to the history of European art, for example, in the sense that there was this sort of slight gap that seems to have allowed for um, an intervention to be made and an emphasis on sort of freedom as a methodology of um, in engaging students. I mean, and, and here actually, I'd love to ask Zarina about her experience at the Slade. This would be my first opportunity to do so. Um, just to understand a little bit more, you know, what it meant for you and in terms of understanding, you know, what, what friendships did you make? What kinds of um, experiences were you a, what worlds did you create while you were there and and that's that's the kind of the those are the kinds of questions that I ask Salah rather than the, the sort of top down questions about you know. Um, how was Slade transnational it's really just about using it as a site for understanding these different kinds of intersections um, between. Um, histories and wanting to, to be able to connect them. Thank you so much I mean Zarina do you want to interject here. Um, yes, I think this uh, the, the slate was uh, much more um, in the kind of mode of Stanley Spencer historically and compared to Goldsmiths, where the debates around feminism were not discussed. So it, it sort of felt um, very difficult to uh, engage and be part of the community. And I think that if you can't engage and be part of the community, it's very difficult to kind of express um, and create in comparison with Goldsmiths. When I first went to Goldsmiths, um, we had to sign the library card and the choice was Ms rather than Miss or Mrs. Uh, so I felt that Goldsmiths was a lot more kind of welcoming of differences um so yes yes you know Ming I just I wanted to go back to the sorry go ahead sorry go ahead. no no please go ahead no I mean it will take you away from your comment oh okay yeah no no I was just going to say that um the parallel experiences yeah. of um conflict are also so something that are that's quite interesting to me you know the ways in which for example Shamsa was affected by um, his encounter with Gombrich um, as somebody who, you know, dis, um, disavowed the history of um, Muslim Islamic art, and um, that that really impacted upon him in a very strong way. And you know, those those histories of rejection are also something that's quite interesting. It's not that um, it's about a sort of filial relationship to a place, but what that place does, what work does it do? to think about people in that space together. Yeah, my, my question is very simple, is that it's interesting how in the history of the slave, it has, the slave has lots of these artists from the colonies uh, or from mm. the global south. Yet the stuff, I, when I think about Gombridge and other people who wrote this major text of art history, taught there at some point or another, do you see in the history of the slave in terms of the instructors or, or is, were there any change uh, uh, that is uh, theoretical or, or, or mentality wise in terms of how to look at art in the context of their encounter with artists from this, uh, you know, empire, other parts of the empire? Or there is no such an advantage? 
Yeah, there is a change. And so I should also point out that the part of the reason why so many artists ended, from the Global South ended up at the Slade was because of um, the privileged position that the Slade had with respect to the Inter-University Council of the Colonies um, and that the um, University of London was sort of in, uh, considered to be the imperial mother this, this is the term that was used for the University of London, which is very interesting. Um, and the slate, of course, had its own sort of re collegiate relationship to the University of London, um, which uh, had a tendency to um, place students at the slate if, for example, they, they had, uh, they got British Council scholarships, or for example. Um, so, um, that's sort of the more insidious side of things. Um, on the um, but at the same time, we're talking about individuals who were trying to build um, a, a world that um, they saw as being um, sort of rich and engaging and sort of trying to understand what a post-war situation looked like, what, what a post-colonial Britain would look like. And so, you know, when um, William Coldstream started as the, the, um, the Slade professor, he started um, advertising in the calendar um, ways for students from um, overseas to submit applications. This was not visible in the calendar before. And so, you know, you could see one sort of small step there. And then when you start going through the archives, you see, you know, Coldstream and, um, you know, Trudarks and Jenkin sort of applying for visas for students and sort of making cases for why there should be international students there. And, you know, that there's a real interest in bringing together um, these transnational dialogues in, you know, very sort of um, historically situated time, right? You have to sort of under, I think it's important to always, to never forget that this is within an umbrella of, you know, a post, uh, a decolonizing Britain, which is, you know, very uneven in terms of the ways in which it is decolonizing. Um, and yet there's a sort of very interesting movement over time. Anyways, I don't want to sort of talk about this for too long, but um, for example, Partha Mitter was um, asked to give some lectures uh, on Indian art history um, in the 70s and um, Seng Yu was asked to give some uh, lectures on art history, uh, on Chinese art history also in the 70s. So, you know, there, there were a few efforts, but honestly, it was um, very, very slow. And um, they're only, they're really starting to think about things now in terms of um, what it means. Yeah, thank you so much. I turn to you, uh, Gita. Of course, as usual, you gave us lots of uh, food for thought and thinking and, and, and uh, typical of you and your writing. So uh, you gave us a great window, of course, you started with, with kind of interrogating up with legacy and, and the kind of questions that uh, you got engaged in and, and uh, the idea or the value of the civic imagination. But also for me, what's more interesting is your shift to, to deal with the present in terms of India and you invoke the past. For us, those were part of the British Empire. India stands as an amazing example of a secular, vibrant democracy that also has a long legacy of engagement with anti-imperialism, decolonization ideas. And also what distinguishes for me, uh, and that will become a contradiction for me when I ask you the question that I wanna ask you, is that is it also one of those countries, um, unlike Sudan and others, uh, is distinguished by the fact there is an intellectual community of people who stayed in, whether they are the subaltern and whether all these things. So there is a vibrant intellectual con uh, you know, community that continues, even though part are moved into the diaspora, but there was always those who stayed and, and India continued to be that center. But the, but the questions that I, what I wanted to ask is that when you alluded to these all uh, uh, new uh, uprisings and especially the farmers uh, uh, evolution and, and also the engagement with women and the land and all of that history, uh, there is something that seems very contradictory here is that how come, of course, people will cite new media and the role of that in terms of the right, the rise of the right wing uh, and Modi and seems they're kind of a stronghold on power now that seems almost impossible to break through 
and regain that kind of legacy of India, whether it's the Congress, whether it's the Marxist engagement in different places. And, and one of the things that I remember Tariq Ali was mentioned in the presentation at the Lahore Biennial, when he was pointing to the student uprising in India, the current one, is that some, there are these interesting signs of some of the students citing the poetry or reciting the poetry of somebody like Faiz Ahmed. Uh, could you just highlight these contradictions? And so for us to really maybe see some hope <laughs> uh, or maybe just at least understand what is going on now, which actually you highlighted, but I thought about just pushing to dig for more. Yes, Salah, the, I actually see no contradiction between uh, the fact that there's a right-wing government and a very now progressively uh, or proto-fascist uh, and the fact that in the student uh, the, the, the student uh, rebellions that took place or rather the student protests that took place that already almost took on the aspect of an all India uh, movement of of, of um, uh, not only questioning, but actually provoking the powers to uh, attend to their uh, urgent questions, that they should then have taken um, examples from or quoted from uh, the entire range of uh, revolutionary texts and poetry and music that was available, available to them from South Asia in, in, in the context of which Faiz is absolutely iconic as much in India as he might be in, uh, in well, at least hugely in India as much as he would of course be in Pakistan and in possibly in the Arab uh, world as well, given that he lived for uh, periods of time in, in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, that Faiz's poetry is actually, if there was any one poet that was put to music and sung on almost every contestatory site, it was Faiz. And at no point did we think it was contradictory because the students, the journalists, the, active, the intellectuals, the artists who were participating were still committed to the idea of uh, a secular nation, but more than that of a collective that works with uh, plural ideas of culture as well as of political possibilities. So that I wouldn't see as a contradiction. What might be a contradiction is that something like the farmers movement, which is extraordinary, and we uh, look uh, at whatever we can almost the entire day, because it, it is so uh, engaging and almost euphoric, uh, that the contradiction there might be that the ideological basis of the movement is not uh, integrated. It is many unions with quite different ideologies from uh, left, ultra left to left to possibly uh, even uh, certainly conservative and even right wing, that that has come together is something truly a citizen's movement. And that is what ho holds hope for the fact that either because of citizen issues, citizenship issue, issues like the citizens uh, CAA that I referred to, or because of economic urgencies that they can be a conflation or a, or, a, or a collectivization of demands and pressures on a government that is singularly uh, intent on both uh, right-wing uh, Hindutva power as well as corporate, co uh, corporate uh, engagements. So I think that is more, in some senses, extraordinary. That the Shaheen Bagh uh, uh, sit-in by the Muslim women over two and a half months, and the Kisans, the farmers, for three and a half months now, that that is a very hybrid, very uh, uh, varied, and uh, very volatile group of uh, uh, of, of citizens who are able to engage. This is probably what even the Marxists who would normally worry about the fact that this is ideologically so mixed, they are not. They see that as a possibility of a new uh, citizen collectives, which might then bring about the kind of change which is historic and then needs to be worked through in terms of what its uh, future ideological or political positions would be.
Thank you so much. I'm going to tell, uh, sorry. Uh, Can I ask Gita a quick question? Okay. Yes. This is Go about ahead. the civic imagination. Okay. Sorry. What ahead. I'm curious about is what made um, this kind of um, solidarity possible across different ideological positions? Because that is actually um, quite unusual in terms of popular movements and the success of popular movements across so such a wide range of different um, thought positions. The uh, movement uh, which uh, I refer to as the Shaheen Bagh uh, encampment, which was run into thousands and continued for um, several months, uh, was the fact that the constitution be was being invoked and the Indians are very proud and very rightfully proud of the Indian constitution, which is regarded one of the most progressive um, texts uh, on citizenship that has been produced in the 20th century in a post in a in a in the transition from the colonial to the post-colonial um, uh, status and that these the the muslim women insisted that they will continually refer to the constitution and demand their rights on that basis would bring together a huge number of uh, collaborators in, in in thought and action and it need not even be on the basis of the secular. We, our generation has grown up on the very committed idea of the secular. This is not necessarily the position that either the, uh, the, the, the Muslim population might take or the Hindu population, or for that matter, the, uh, the Dalits. This is not necessarily the central idea of, of India, the modern secular nation state. It has an enormous amount of contention now. But the fact that the constitution still could bring together uh, otherwise uh, reticent women from their homes out into the public square and invite the most radical uh, flanks of the students to come and participate with them was one phenomenon. The Kisan and Dolan has a very specific reason. It is an economic uh, quest. It is an economic demand. So there, the even the right-wing unions of the farmers are joining in because it is a very confrontational economic demand. And that is also hopeful because what it means is that the economy can create or generate another kind of collectivity, which then has a future, not necessarily laid out in the most uh, you know, assured or optimistic ways, but that it has a future. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to shift to the question that I now posted in the chat. Uh, and I think I just urge you, the panelists, and urge everybody else to be brief uh, because we have uh, literally about maybe 40 minutes uh, left for this. So um, the question is for you, uh, Zarina, so from Joy Chansey, that is your work often alludes to social issues and histories through sensory elements. Can you tell us more about your studio practice and why you choose to develop work in this way? So, um, partly because um, if we take the example of she'd love to breathe pure silence, which is to do with um, virginity test that was never discussed properly in the media. So in a way I want to look at these things to, or, or even like Lead White, which was commissioned by Shah Jad Foundation. Uh, these are archives that kind of, I think are disappearing and there needs to be a record. There needs to be a discussion about what the, the past, the history was. But I think also in, in doing so, the physicality of making it kind of uh, makes it possible to look at it in a new way, to think about these things in a new way. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me just turn now to you. I think it is to you from Chica, uh, Gita. That is, what do agonistics uh, agonistic struggle necessary for decolonize or sites of struggle look look like in art history, artistic practice, and curation. 
Salah, so just uh, just repeat that. It wasn't completely clear. Just repeat I think, that. I think there is something missing in the in the. But I would try to read it again. What do agonistic struggle uh, uh, necessary uh, for uh, decolonize or for sites of a struggle? Uh, and then it says look like in art history, artistic practice, and curation. So I guess it's questioning the notion of uh, this agonistic that you mentioned. If I'm not mistaken. Yes, um, I'm. Uh, I engage with it on the on the basis of that difference between antagonistic and agonistic, which is of course a fundamental uh, issue that uh, Chantal Mouffe uh, presents as as uh, one with clear binary of I and I and the other as an enemy uh, and the agonistic as adversaries who continue to question the uh, ground of uh, commonality, but are able to dialogue uh, in certain at certain political conjunctures. And I think that uh, perhaps within the, uh, it may come from two sources, my, uh, my interest in, uh, or my, um, my interest in this, this concept. One would be that we have the history of uh, the civil disobedience movement of Gandhi, which uh, certainly spoke and uh, worked against the notion of antagonism. And that uh, the, uh, even the, the imperial uh, powers were at most seen as adversaries, but not as enemies. And this was very, I was talking to a Gandhi scholar recently precisely on this to question him to, uh, in order to understand that even the word adversary in some senses would not belong to the vocabulary of Gandhi. He was not willing even to concede the notion of I and the other. This incidentally, I do know has been hugely, deeply, radically questioned by uh, many counter thinking, counter, counter arguments and positions particularly of the Dalit um, scholars and activists. But let us for the moment uh, consider that this is one of the inheritances that um, my generation and several uh, related uh, 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 cultural, uh, uh, cultural workers might have had as part of our history. Now, the, uh, the Adversarial, adversarial position after uh, gaining independence, then is obviously nurtured or, or developed during the Cold War period. So uh, there one could move between the antagonistic and the agonistic. But perhaps now as a, as a social, within the social order in several decades after um, the nation state has been in, uh, in, in, in uh, operation and we see all the reasons why it has in fact it, it is undermining the very notion of citizenship through its own uh, policies then the choice of retaining the agonistic position would be one that i think comes not so much entirely from the political but from the fact that i and you all, all of you work within art history and aesthetics that within this field uh, the uh, valencies of the word agonistic might just be more productive to our uh, engagement with the uh, community or the society or the historical conjuncture in which we live. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from John Ten that is uh, said, thank you all. Gita pointed out the role of biennials in the South and in agonistic struggles. Uh, something Zarina Bimji work at Documenta also evoked. My Ming, be able to say how the biennial form itself might address antagonistic polarities that she points to. Ming, I guess the question moves around and then end up with you. Okay. Can you repeat the um, last bit? Sure. You wanna, sorry, you wanna go ahead, Zarina, first? Or? Uh, I didn't understand the last bit of the question. Uh, it was asking Ming, uh, if you'd be able to say how the biennial form itself might address antagonistic polarities that she points to. 
Okay. Thank you for the question, John. Um, and here, I think it's important to make distinctions between different types of biennials. Um, I, I think that um, it's probably most productive to think about um, the kinds of biennials that Gita was pointing to, biennials of the South, or um, what Ranjit Hoskote calls um, biennials of resistance, that, you know, that these are sites of um, dialogue of engagement. Um, and, you know, I'm not arguing for um, a, a retreat from any type of um, political engagement. It's not about avoiding antagonisms and it's not about sort of um, uh, just finding solutions that are um, without friction. Rather, it's about trying to find those places of friction and trying to understand how we can use them productively, or maybe as Gita um, just said, um, agonistically in order to create um, discourses and um, sites of negotiation that um, are sometimes uncomfortable, you know, that, that put the, our, our politics into question um, by really situating us with um, people that, with positions that we don't agree with, right? And it's precisely that those moments of um, agonistic encounter that are, are really quite important. Um, and that I, I think we have, well, that I mean, we, through social media, et cetera, it, we, you know, we've created these silos that, are, are, that have become um, a little too comfortable. So I, I'm really um, trying to push us um, towards the kinds of, not, I'm not trying to push people, us, but rather that um, I think that these biennials of resistance really allow us to explore the agonistic encounters that are quite important to this struggle. Uh, Sheena asked an interesting question, which any of you can, can add, and I, I certainly have just a few takes on it. It says, uh, thank you for fascinating talks. It would be interesting to know if similar research is being done on other former uh, colonial countries and students from uh, global South, such as former Soviet Union. Uh, from the very few that I know that there are some shows that allude to this, for example, Red Africa, uh, that was, uh, I think it started in Bayreuth and traveled to other places. And Mark Nash was one of the people who were involved in that. It, it, it focuses on work and cinema by mostly people from the former uh, Soviet Union and Eastern uh, European Socialist Bloc in relation to Africa. There was the exhibit on Yugoslavian architecture uh, uh, that was at MoMA, had some allusion to things like that. And, and, I, and, and for sure, in the context of cinema that I know is that many of the West African, Sudanese and others, even Egyptian, studied in the Soviet Union in the Films Academy. And that, of course, influenced the work in terms of how Soviet uh, um, uh, socialist realism or also in the context of, of, of Ethiopia during the Derg era, which is um, supposedly a Marxist era that many students also studied. Uh, but the answer for me is not well studied. So, so it may be, uh, I don't know if uh, any of you could just say a few things about that. And, and, and uh, I'm sure this legacy goes back I mean, in India and other places that had a strong link to the Soviet Union. But briefly, please, because I wanted to get to other questions. Any? Gita Ming. I'm sorry, I didn't get the thrust of the question. It is to do with the the connections with the uh, with the in terms Russia of and training, the in terms of our training because I think it's alluding our to training. What, yeah, in terms of what uh, uh, Ming was talked about in terms of talked about in terms of the slave, whether there are similar studies that have been done for the poor because that is for sure. I know in Africa, that was the only place uh, for a long time that allowed at the undergraduate level, that kind of training. Uh, most people who went to the West went as postgraduates, uh, but the Soviet Union provided and the Eastern Bloc, East Germany, others provided lots of scholarship free for, uh, as part of the solidarity with the decolonization. A lot of Indian uh, artists, but even more writers, went to the uh, to East Europe and to the Soviet Union. And um, the, I don't know if they particularly uh, 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 entered the institutions as students, 
but they were given opportunities to be to have studios to interact to be part of what would be, have been at that time the artists uh, consortiums under the socialist regime um, and that the entire interaction between the Indian, Indian cultural um, uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, members of the Indian cultural system were, was very, very uh, close and very persistent for all these years until, in actual fact, until the, uh, the change of regime. So um, there was a continual interaction at the level of visits, workshop or, or studio visits or residencies with the Eastern European countries. I'm not sure of institutional uh, association amongst the, in, 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 in art schools. Ming, briefly, do you have any thoughts on um, this? Yeah, just, I, I just wanted to bring up two very quick examples, um, Shakira Lee and Zainal Abedin, um, both of whom were, um, who both spent time in sort of Western art institutions and also in Eastern Europe. So I, I think it's not a, I just want to point out that it's not a question of either or, but that a lot of figures sort of circulated between um, the different opportunities that were um, made available to them. And so, you know, having to make a clear Cold War choice um, was, was not actually the case and that they navigated between those different worlds. Uh, Basil Haddad has a, Question for you, Zarina, that uh, he said historic sites and abandoned structures take a central role in your work, especially the films. How, how, how can artists deploy the built environment to, repair, sorry, to retell history? The last bit I didn't hear that, Salah, please, could you repeat? How can, how can artists deploy the built environment to retell history? by research that's by um sorry the question is that how can i retell the history through the built environment through the history how do you deploy it in your work? sorry could you repeat your question again please i didn't it, understand it, uh, you were talking about how historic sites and abandoned structures take a central role in your work especially in the films so the question is, how can artists deploy the built environment to retell history, to re-narrate? How you can tell, um, basically, uh, I do it through physically making the work in terms of retelling um, through sound, through music, Sorry, I'm, I'm struggling to answer this question. Um, uh, I think I think you have done it in your earlier, you know, reflections on the work when I've asked you earlier. The process, so perhaps reflecting, so it, researching, and so forth, and producing. So through through the research, it's I suppose it's uh, the way. Thank you, Stella. The way I approach it is to um, I look at legal documents um, by doing local research, uh, going to archives, and putting together some kind of uh, structure and narrative, and then when I go on on these. Uh, spaces, I forget about the research and let, let the camera, let the lens uh, speak and unravel it. Uh, and then I kind of come back to the studio and um, edit the material and it then takes another shape. So it's constantly uh, rewinding, unwinding, going back and forth till it feels that it's completed. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to yeah. move and I hope also all of you could just the panelists have precise answers. Uh, Tariq Abul Futuh, uh, I think the question is for Gita. He said in the lecture of Okwi that Gita referenced, he mentioned these pressures, uh, pressure points for civic actions uh, as at once local and national, global and transnational. How does Gita seize the farmers' marshes in India 
Is it merely national? And if we imagine a transnational reach or implications, will it be stronger? Um, well, certainly this, uh, these massive rallies and the sustained, um, sustained commitment that they have been able to, uh, to, the, to, to, to in fact uh, present to an unsympathetic and uh, uh, antagonistic uh, government and state um, has the potential to uh, not only unravel the regime, which is one of the one of the pro prognostications that is being made, but more importantly, it is based on a question of the corporate takeover of Indian in, in, in agriculture. In the process, the farmers have so so precisely and intelligently understood the role of global capital, and that I think has wide implications. Their own understanding is one thing, but it's then it's reverberations in terms of other um, societies and, and nations or um, uh, uh, groupings uh, across the uh, region, uh, certainly South Asia, but it could be much larger, that the questioning of global capital and its mediators in these particular countries in India, in this case, they have actually named the corporates that are uh, being uh, privileged to take over um, large tracts of environment uh, of, of land for mining with no consideration of environment, etc., as well as taking over the function of the public uh, public sector by demolishing all institutions of the public sector in order to enter the economic field. And so the understanding by such a large in thousands and in what uh, would be millions for, for certain of this phenomenon has implications both in the understanding of global capital, but also in reverse, the understanding by other similar uh, uh, societies of what is possible in terms of resistance. Thank you so much. I have uh, another uh, intervention from Elizabeth Georges. Uh, she said, Gita, I'm a great admirer. Of course, we are all admirers. <laughs> Your consistent undertaking of the aesthetic being always political is something intimately is something that I intimately share. How is it, uh, how is that perceived in the curatorial practice of contemporary India? Contemporary India? Yes, in India. So, Salah, sorry, the last, what is the specific thing? How is what perceived? What is, uh, she was talking about your consistent undertaking of the aesthetic being always political is something I intimately share. How is it that Perceive how would this kind of engagement of, of, of aesthetics in the context of uh, the political? How is that perceived in the curatorial practice of contemporary India? I would say that if we were to take the Biennales, uh, the Kochi Biennale, for instance, then I would say it is very much uh, uh, in in play in the cur curatorial um, agendas that they set themselves. Each curator curator different from the other. And you will hear Anita Dube speaking about her last edition, which very definitely engages with the issue of the aesthetic and the political, and very much with the, uh, with the, with the concept of affect and passion. I think she would be a very good person to elucidate this in her, in her presentation. Uh, I, would, and I would add, I would annotate what I've said by the fact, by uh, adding, uh, adding the that I actually turned the argument that I was making, starting with Okwi's in, uh, in this particular case, his his argument for the civic imagination. I turned it somewhat. Uh, 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 well, I turned it without making a point of it in the end by suggesting that I would go back to Chantal Mouffe and the agonistic relationship, which allows for affect and passion, but also maintains the adversarial uh, position uh, within, the, uh, within the aesthetic itself. And that for me, the paradigm of aesthetics and politics works more um, with greater certainty 
than the idea of the civic imagination. And that might be in fact, one step uh, earlier in the discursive field and Okwi was pushing it into another area of investigation, which I admire and follow, but perhaps I tend to relapse into the more, uh, uh, more uh, established or not established, the more uh, engaging for me uh, paradigm of the aesthetic and political. I think that the curatorial practices in India are developing this uh, understanding. I don't know that we have a theoretical basis for that. this on, on, on the curatorial front, yes, but certainly I think an engagement with it. Uh, there is a, a private comment that I wanted to share from Poor al Hassan, who was actually also a student at the state. And she reflected by saying, when I was studying there, I had a tutor who told me, your work isn't very Islam. And he told a young woman from Taiwan that your work isn't very Chinese. So I, I was wondering, what is your reflection? Because that's typical of course. In that is really interesting. And I can't wait to be able to have a conversation with her about this. Um, you know, it's, I, I'm wondering about um, the, the space that, it was opened up um, at the Slade because it's a very ambivalent one. Um, and it seems to me, the more that I look into um, the archives, that there was some expectation that um, students would be doing something different if they were coming from the global south, which on the one hand is, um, gives, you know, it's, it's, they're burdened with the burden of representation as Coben and Mercer puts it. Um, but at the, on the other hand, it also freed them from having to follow um, the, the models that were um, so strict um, or that were, you know, the, the, the strict models of Western modernism or of the academic tradition at the, that was being taught at the Slade. So what I'm thinking is that there is this sort of site uh, of sort of one one might envision it as the, the site that's the, the place that's opened up also by primitivism, that there's a, a door that's opened um, that is, is stepped through by students who were at the Slade, but that there's a, a, a sort of turn and an agential turn that um, allow that that sort of um, serves as a site of articulation of something um, that is um, much more about the, the students um, own, you know, whatever it is that they're doing, there, there's a sort of, there's an opening for them to um, do something new, to do something that um, decolonizes the politics of what they're being taught in that institutional context. So I'm still sort of working this, this ambivalence out and I'm tr still trying to figure out how to theorize it, but um, that doesn't surprise me at all. So thank you for sharing that, Hora. No, it, it is interesting and, uh, that you cited Kavina Mercer because that's typical in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, pedagogy in that, in that kind of, uh, Colonized mm. uh, space. Uh, uh, it, the whole idea is that you are expected to study your own. You are not. But I think, interestingly, many of the artists uh, they have managed to maneuver through this. Even in the context of the United States, uh, you'll find somebody like Spike Lee who could resort to doing a film with no black people. For example, all of a sudden, uh, um, I would think about like uh, uh, Steve McQueen doing uh, uh, Hunger. As, as, a, as a maybe an unconscious response to that idea that he stick to a black subject. And then he goes back to it in 12 years later. And it was also said to us that why would you wanna, why can't you study Sudan when I was doing, you know, so there's always this expectation. So I wanna move quickly to a, an interesting question from Jack. If we consider, that's how the question goes or the comment. If we consider public art as a visual node demonstrating the relationship between art and civic imagery. In this period of time, when countless monuments have been subjected to actual or metaphorical toppling, it seems that a vacuum has been created in the civic imaginary for what must necessarily replace them and why. How can we navigate this moment? I have an answer, but I, I want to, any of you could reflect uh, on 
Gita, um, any of you guys, uh, Katarina. Do, do you mind just repeating the question again? Because I think I might have missed a piece. Okay. If we consider public art as a visual note demonstrating the relationship between art and civic imagery, in this period of time, when countless monuments have been subjected to actual or metaphorical topics. It seems that a vacuum has been created in the civic imaginary for what must necessarily replace them and why. How can we navigate this moment? Any of you can uh, go ahead. There's a word which I'm sorry, I haven't got that the, the that they have been subjected to what? To toppling. I mean, whether to metaphorical toppling. or actual okay. toppling. toppling. Sorry, I don't monuments. Know. Whether it's the roads must fall or any other, you know, in the United States, all of these places, uh, you know, monuments. Or, I, I think it's I, oh, go ahead. that. Sorry. Um, I think I think that um, this needs to be kind of. Uh, debated in a way that, in my view, is that I think that in terms of exhibitions, often solo exhibitions are given to white men. And I think that maybe what should happen next five years, I know this is really radical to say that there should be more exhibitions by women of color and uh, women and women of uh, people of color so that the structure could move around and there could be a space to work out what, how, how to do things. Because at the moment, like even the, these exhibitions are mainly like less people of color and women get spaces. So I think that it needs to be done on a practical level through writing, through thinking, through exhibitions. That's what I would propose. Gita, Ming, quickly, if you can. I'd like to be able to answer Jack, but I'm not sure I can. Okay, so let me just um, say so there is an appeal. There is an appeal from the audience, and I'm taking this to the organizers. There are three of them there, March meeting, March meeting, March meeting, or four. There is an appeal to extend this maybe more 10 minutes. Uh, and the comment actually came from Chica, who said, uh, we can stay uh, long today. Take your time. We don't need to cut the panel off. Any answer? 10 minutes. We're begging for 10 minutes. I'm happy to stay. Okay. I'm happy. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, absolutely. OK. I'm so your take, uh, Ming, until I, I, I see an answer from the organizer. OK, OK. So um, basically, I think that the, the, the key to this question is really um, to think about what do we mean when we talk about publics, right? Who's public are we talking about when we talk about public art? And, you know, in the past, these monuments were erected as part of a hegemonic system of, of empire, right? That was supposed to create a kind of obedience in the public, a kind of Althusserian sort of, um, gesture of um, creating um, subjects to, to empire, let's say, for example. Um, and what's important now is to rethink what we mean by the public and to think about how those spaces can be used to rearticulate what we mean when we say a public. And here, this is where, I mean, I, I think, you know, um, the work of Suzanne Simard is really inspiring to me in the sense that it's about reimagining what it means to be together. What does a public mean? And that those um, mycorrhizal networks are, you know, filled with difficulty and filled with friction and filled with uh, debate. But, you know, if we could use those spaces as spaces of public engagement, um, and, uh, you know, for me, it, it's really about um, the uncertainty of, of what one might put in such a monumental place that could be really exciting. Um, 
And I think that's perhaps what all that we're ready for at this moment, rather than sort of um, a, a counter hegemonic gesture that would, um, you know, take a, a really clear stand about um, where we want to go. I think it's important for us to listen and to 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 find new ways of being together. Uh there is a question from Kika, Gita, he said, given contemporary arts usually strong ties to corporate capital, how is it responding to these socialist struggles in India today how, or in today's India? How the artists or, uh, or the, or the system? Art in general. Sorry? He said contemporary art is usually tied to, to, to uh, had a strong ties to corporate capital. How is it possible to respond to this socialist struggle in the context of, uh, for, for contemporary art? How is it possible uh, or how, how would it respond, let's say, uh, to socialist struggles in today's India? Yes, um, that is why uh, Salah, or I'll address this to Chika, I hesitated to, and I would continue to hesitate for a fair uh, um, amount of time to actually begin to articulate through naming artists who might engage with it or the, uh, uh, or the art world to engage with it because precisely the, uh, the phenomenon in which uh, contemporary art exists does not uh, automatically or immediately uh, engage with and, and, and even uh, understand or assimilate something of this nature, which is true also not only of artists, but it would be true of me and, and uh, many uh, people within the um, art world, uh, the attempt to understand analytically uh, would come from, I think, very definitely for us through our political and social uh, thinkers. And, 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 and we have uh, analyses from the Marxist uh, historians and political theorists, and we have uh, analyses from uh, the subaltern studies and we'll have an, uh, analyses from the Dalit thinkers. So I think we would wait for one to even understand, leave alone respond and create uh, alternative forms of uh, articulation within the arts. So I wouldn't actually, uh, uh, I wouldn't deny or I wouldn't uh, uh, be anxious about how the artists will respond, but I will also not be in a hurry to um, articulate that and to present that as a, as a possibility. But the, at the time that Okwi, for instance, in the, in the exhibition related to meeting point, six, meeting point six, he was able to draw upon a very large um, uh, uh, group of artists who had been working precisely within what he was calling the civic imagination and not a political event there and then. So I think that we would also have to work over a long period of time. Now he's asking also, Chika is of course asking that the system in which contemporary art works is a globalized or it's a market system. It's, a, it, it's part of the uh, system of capital within the nation as well as in terms of um, international galleries and uh, exhibiting spaces. I think that question would be, uh, Chika, uh, relevant to any artist working anywhere, that this would not be a question that would be specific to the in artist in India. This would be a question that is uh, repeatedly asked and imperfectly answered in uh, terms of what is the, what are the possibilities of, of a creative relationship to social movements and uh, to changing history and historical conjunctures that we are today talking about. Okay, there was a question that came in Arabic and it, it, it basically, I will have try to translate it, uh, is that the, uh, all your talks touch on these, uh, on the colonial, post-colonial uh, uh, period and their implication even for uh, uh, now in Sharjah. Uh, is, there, is there any way that you can comment within this context on uh, women's art or feminist art? Okay. okay. It's a question that I try to translate as much as possible so to get it. So it's, uh, it's about women art in that kind of context of the colonial, post-colonial. Sorry, it's about? 
women's art or feminist art, uh, the translation could go is, is that like comments on that in the context of the whole talk about civic engagement. I think some of you are, you know, got into it and by virtue of uh, being women, there's a lot of reflections on that that happen. But if you have a specific comment, I think the question. Zarina would probably have that. So what, I, the question is that something to do with feminism and but women's I, art. All in terms of any comment on women's art within that larger context of the colonial, post-colonial. Oh. It was calling for a comment for a specific. Okay. Zarina is an example. Zarina herself is an example. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, what, Victorina, did you want to say something? No, you go ahead, thank you. Go ahead. No, I think it's an, it's an important question. Um, and obviously um, one that ideally examines um, intersectionalities between uh, gender and colonialism and understands those as being linked struggles, right? That these, this isn't about post-colonialism versus feminism, but about sort of articulating um, a struggle against um, stru structures of domination and hegemony that um, have multiple different um, outcomes and that it's, you know, we can't pit one against the other, but really understand them as intersectional struggles. Well, thank you. I think uh, we probably almost uh, used the additional 10 minutes, uh, but I just uh, I wonder if there is any final thoughts from each of you that you wanted to give. Just something that you couldn't talk about or you wish to talk about or just you wish to say. So I'll start with you, Gita. But why don't you do a summing up, uh, Salah? Because that would be very useful for us. No, I, I think not summing, it, not summing up, I, uh, but the rearticulation of the positions. I, I think it is impossible to sum up this kind of a. But not sum up. I didn't mean sum up, but to no, I, no, reflect I, I, constellation of these. I mean, there is there is lots to be said. I think that the, the, the question moved from an artistic practice that has a, this kind of a, a theoretical edge to it, like in the work uh, of Zarina, moved into. Uh, your talk, uh, Ming, about how you really look at, at basically questioning art history in the context of, of the uh, civic engagement. You've alluded to certain specific experiments by artists. You looked at that history or tried to see rises through works by artists. Uh, and then you end up with the rewriting the history of maybe art uh, pedagogy or art history through colonial education and in which you, you in, implicated or you brought in the example of, of the slave. And, and I think that's, uh, that's open up for the audience, uh, whether they're students or scholars of art history, many, as you've noticed from the question itself, many branches uh, that, we, that needed to be addressed actually, uh, like the question that was uh, asked about, what about other places outside the uh, colonial uh, Western system, the Soviet Union, which is in and of itself is a very interesting, complex uh, situation. Now people reflect on it and try to equate the two polarities of the Cold War as if they were the same. Uh, but in the context of force of decolonization, yeah. uh, they were different. Uh, uh, they were totally different. Uh, uh, there was a solidarity with the, with the, uh, and there are so many things that we didn't point about, point to in terms of the, uh, uh, in the post Bandung, for example, uh, um, uh, the, the solidarity that emerged. Uh, and that is very important in terms of civic, because civic engagement and in the art, in literature and others, the association of Afro Asian artists, uh, the tri continental uh, meeting in 1966 in Cuba, and the rise of the uh, tri continental uh, journal. Uh, and that was became a forum for lots of you know, engagement of across Asia, Africa, and Latin America, because what Bandung did brought in uh, basically Asia and Africa, but then the, the Cuban revolution and its aftermath brought in the tri-continental and others. 
And then, of course, the question that, 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 that is raised sometimes is some of the question about the transnational aspects of this, whether we speak about the link between contemporary art and the corporate world, there is always this question now, how do you do solidarity today? How, do, I mean, there is an emergence now of decolonizing all of these institutions. I think there are rich experiments now of how to engage with that. I mean, I give, for example, one example in the post-apartheid post -apartheid in South Africa, how do, what do you, how do you do or how do you deal with the legacy of apartheid that is so entrenched in the public space, especially in the monument for the Verbood and for the Botas and, and all those architects of the apartheid regime. Of course, there was, uh, uh, of course, uh, Roads Must Fall as a movement that was recent, but it was attached to the colonial structure and within the apartheid system and the legacy of education there that was actually definitely a, 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 a an apartheid in itself and it has legacy today. But there is the museum of apartheid that try to echo some of the other experiments in terms of making whites, for example, when you enter that museum to go through the black gate and experience what it meant. I'm not sure how it effective it is, but experience what it meant to be black, black during the apartheid and for blacks to move through the white gates uh, and, and experience that within a space uh, that is also in and of itself like a museum, a part of a colonial legacy. So, but that these are the kind of experiment that could be an answer to some of what Jack uh, in his question pursued in terms of what do we deal with? How, how, uh, how do we deal with these monuments? Uh, for me, okay, there was always a, pe a period when people uh, 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 just throw this monument away, destroying them and why not? Uh, but there was also a period of questioning. And that brought back actually a very interesting uh, uh, presentation yesterday by Amina Minia of how a post-colonial artist who was part of the Algerian uh, uh, struggle as a freedom fighter dealt with a, a, one of the most important monument for French colonialism in Algeria. Uh, he as an artist had that affinity with the artist, but also understanding how that artist was part of the colonial structure. What he did, he covered, instead of destroying the monument, he covered it with a structure that's fragile, that over time will reveal the layer. So that was, and I don't know if it's accidental or not, but it was a very interesting project that one could think about. I think the question that I raised today, the presentation dealt with the fundamental, I would say in many ways, with the fundamental question of thinking historically in the present. And I admire all the, uh, 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 the, the presentation and the question that brought some aspect of that theme that is going to be across uh, the, the biennial, which is as conceived by Okwe. Uh, Gita, you gave us an amazing example of, of bringing that reading, you know, Okwe, uh, uh, although he's not that much of a history or a history, historical, I mean, he's part of our presence and, and continue to be, but you, you kind of brought his ideas and his relevance of his ideas in questioning and in dealing with that fundamental question of the thinking historically in the present. And the examples of India, of course, is fascinating. And I think it's relevant to all of what happened in post, what we call it in Africa, post-structural adjustment. That euphoria yeah. of, of decolonization, yeah. of course, uh, uh, destroyed by all of these military coups, wars, inter-ethnic uh, de-ethnicization uh, uh, in the era of post-nationalism uh, or post, and, and, and all, let us all to still rethink and question the, uh, the, the, the nature of the, of, the, of the nation state and how do you engage with it in, in literature, in art and other things. I mean, Mahmoud Mamdani's work on uh, uh, citizen and subjects remain fundamental to understanding that and to understand the implications of that in the post-colonial state and, 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 and it, uh, whatever you see it in praxis and, and, in, and in behavior. So it's, it's, it's interesting, but it also shows us that, that change is still possible, whether it's the Arab Spring, whether this uprising that we see in India and other places, it opened up new possibilities, but it also asks us for a new theoretical intervention. Because obviously, all revolution ideas are now very difficult. 
how do you deal with solidarity is now very difficult. When, when solidarity becomes uh, incriminated or become criminalized, as Ari Ali once said in our context, in our conference on, on, uh, on, re, uh, uh, on um, axis of solidarity in London, he raised the question is that how do you do solidarity now? Uh, how do we remember Bandung and post Bandung and what's happening now? But I think all of these questions are very important and calls for, and I think in a way it may seem gloomy, but it's also interesting because that's how paradigm shifts happen. Is the starting with the questioning which what we are doing now and hopefully throughout these dialogues uh, uh, in the March meeting and other forums that new paradigms for, for changing the world and, become, and, and creating a better society will emerge. It didn't emerge uh, uh, you know, in, in the era of decolonization out of the blue. It was a long protracted struggle. And then we dealt with the, the, the legacy of colonialism and how do you deal with it in the context of a, a transnational, uh, uh, very difficult uh, corporate world. So anyway, I think you left us with a lot of food for thought. And I hope I did a good summary. It was, you forced me to improvise. And but I that, that's, I it. That, that contribution is as and more significant, Salah. Thank you very much. This, this, this. So thanks to, to all of you and thanks to the organizers uh, uh, of this and thanks for their patience. They gave us actually 15 minutes more. So thank we should you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.